welcome to the Kennedy Events Podcast, where we feature top marketing, communications, and future of work leaders and share their biggest takeaways and insights. We love these conversations and hope you will too. Let's get started. Hi, and welcome to today's podcast episode. I'm Paige Buck, Partner and Chief Strategy Officer at Kennedy Events. I'm delighted to be with my friend and collaborator uh, and guest today, Cara Rose DeFabio, a writer, artist, and producer who is proud to serve as the Cultural Strategy Director for the Economic Security Project. In this role, she has invited artists into policy fights, foregrounded storytelling alongside data in changing minds, and produced events that organize people and ideas towards a more just economy. She is passionate about unwinding the deeply rooted myths of American culture through conversation and creativity and draws on her background in theater and journalism to push new narratives forward. Hi, Kara. How are you today? Hi, Paige. Thank you for having me. Very glad you're here. So how did you get started in all of this? Where do you draw all on? What do you draw on uh, to deliver all these things for ESP? Oh, wow. Well, as you mentioned, um, I'm a theater kid and um, I really, uh, I really love making shows. I love making shows that get people to think. And that's kind of how I got into the realm of making content. I worked in media for a while, um, producing live events. We collaborated on some of those that, um, that really kind of brought, uh, you know, what you read in, um, at that time, maybe a newspaper paper or, or a website. To what? Life. What? <laughs> I know. Remember those? What is that? Um, yeah. um, brought them to, kind of to life to people through real events. And, um, and, and through that, I kind of just um, met people that brought me into this progressive organizing space. And um, it's been a real, both a learning journey and a real pleasure in terms of like, how do I use my skill set to um, uh, to make change in the world um, cool. and and kind of foreground um, some of the issues of economic justice that we work on? Yeah, and so we're going to throw around some words that probably some of our listeners might not be familiar with because I wasn't familiar with them all that long ago, and I've been doing this a long time now. So it's always awesome to, I mean be in a space where there's like continued learning. So phrases I hadn't thinking about this for progressive organizing and the use of events for, as you just said, like changing minds and changing policy um, and making the world a more just place. You um, used a phrase that like, and it's one of those, now that I've heard it, I've heard it a thousand times, but was new to me of narrative change. Can you explain in your a little bit, what how you think of narrative change? Sure. So um, narratives are kind of deeply held um, stories, oftentimes myths that really kind of like guide and shape our experience in the world. So um, for us, when we talk about narrative change at uh, Economic Security Project, um, when we're focusing on really trying to eliminate poverty in the United States we look at the kind of stories that we tell ourselves around um, how you succeed and how you um, gain wealth. And so one of those myths and the narratives that we're trying to change in American culture is this, and you may have heard this idea before, the bootstraps myth. So this idea that you can, in the United States, you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps um, and that there's a meritocracy and that you can, um, you can achieve th things through your willpower as an individual alone. Um, and that's not true. <laughs> it's just not true. There's systemic um, oppression and inequality that is baked in um, to not just our economics and our public policy, but also like how we view the world. And so what um, narrative change seeks to do is to accumulate stories of, of of real people in their real lives that can kind of knit them together so that they're more than the sum of their parts and that they begin to present other narratives to kind of uh, usurp those myths that dangerous myths that kind of guide a lot of our thinking. Yeah, like um, 
a lot of the books on the shelf behind me are like my favorite works of fiction. And a lot of the books are business books that I'm sure are just riddled with every metaphor for bootstrapping and nose to the grindstone and stick to itiveness. And, you know, there's also the like the exceptionalism, you know, that we um are so, is so like deeply baked into who we are in this country. Um, the it, it it sounds like a lot to overcome to tell a different story. Um, yeah, and we should. I mean, we should say narrative change is a slow grind. I mean, this is a multi generational kind of um, fight, and a lot of the myths that we're talking about are like since the inception of our country. This has been how we have been taught to think about these things, or perhaps since the inception of a religion we might follow. Like there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of really deep seated um, things and it is very much uh, the water we're swimming in. So it's, it's very easy not to see the influence of these myths on our daily life. And so um, a lot of the work I do just tries perhaps through even telling the story of an individual that's impacted by these myths and systems um, to try and chip away at that um, a little bit um, with with every story we tell. Yeah, and so outside outside of, uh, let's stay away from events for a minute um, or like traditional, what we mean when we say events. Outside of a convening, a conference, a gala, a, you know, a, a, even a virtual meeting, your work is bigger than that. And so, and you draw on a lot of different like means of, shifting minds and uh, bringing different voices into the space. What are some of the other non-event things that you that you draw on? Yeah, so events are definitely kind of a, a tool in my toolbox. And um, there's other things that we do a lot too. Sometimes that's bringing an artist um, into a fight, um, which might be like uh, last year we, um, we, worked with an artist group called The Illuminator to project in DC uh, a message of monopolies must go during like a critical legislative moment in an anti-monopoly fight. And so that was kind of an art installation slash protest um, that, uh, that, you know, we were really hoping like maybe, um, maybe some Congress members are going to see this on their drive home, you know, it's kind of like a bet there, or at least the public and start talking about it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a lot. That's another thing is like a lot of these kind of projects are to spark conversation. And, and a lot of times we talk about like how to change the kind of dinner table conversation around some of these events or uh, some of these issues or uh, mythologies. And so, yeah, so we might work with an artist directly or like in, um, in Stockton, California, when we were helping to launch the first um, uh, mayor led guaranteed income pilot there ahead of the pilot, what we came in to do is we worked with um, three muralists that did murals throughout the city um, that really sparked the conversation so that there was a way in for people to have a conversation around what a guaranteed income could mean for their community. Hmm. Um, and so a lot of it could be arts engagement. Um, some of the other things that we've done um, are like hold a story, uh, a creative fiction contest around um, uh, what uh, basic income could look like, a guaranteed income could look like in some sort of sci-fi future. Oh, I uh, love it. It was really fun. Yeah. Um, and um, let me see, what else? Uh, so yeah, a lot of it is like, how do we bring in creative space? And then a lot of it is storytelling. And a lot of it is making sure that as much as data might be foregrounded in making policy um, decisions um, when we get to that point that we're really doing the work to bring the stories of people who are impacted by those policies um, to bear, not just in terms of how they show up for as, as constituent stories for someone who might be an elected who's making those kind of public policy choices, but also in the field of public opinion. And so how do we really lift those stories up and those champions of ideas um, to have like a bigger a bigger mic and a bigger platform to um, kind of shift the zeitgeist, the kind of like uh, social thinking around an idea. So when you're talking about shifting the zeitgeist and the long game that is narrative change, what sort of pressures do you face to justify, like to justify the event, to justify the spend 
when somebody, you know, in your organization or outside is saying like, okay, but what's the ROI on that? Mm, That's a great question, Paige. (laughs) It's always really difficult. And it's specifically, I would say, difficult to show how have you changed someone's mind? You know, we do a lot of public opinion polling. That's one Mm -hmm. thing we do Mm -hmm. um, to see how people are thinking about and talking about um, our specific issues. But I think um, in a larger sense, how you measure something like narrative change, I still think is um, highly debatable and how much you can kind of uh, put numbers to those kinds of um, <laughs> those kinds of uh, returns on the investment. But, and there's other really very tangible ways um, that I think um, once you start doing these, specifically these events um, that are really organizing people around an idea, you'll start to see the return um, pretty quickly afterward. And that the way that that has worked for us is that, you know, you can do all the numbers. You can know how many people were in the doors, like how much did you spend per head? Um, you know, how, many, how much press pickup did you get? Um, right. All of these things. But you could also mention it, you could also measure it a little bit more like how many new things were said on stage? How, how much like did we move forward in terms of how we're thinking about or talking about the idea or afterward um, and sometimes frustratingly a lot of this isn't visible until after the event yes however um for us um a lot of times it'll be that we've invited a funder to an event and through the event they understand what the issue is they understand who's working on the issue and they're much more able to fund because they're like, I get it now. Like, um, and so we'll see, we'll see grants come in the door. Another thing is there'll be people, and we've had this at maybe most of the events, the big events that we've thrown in the five years that I've been at Economic Security Project, who will meet at an event and they'll find a collaborator and they'll start working and pushing the field forward that way. And so the way that we talk about um that we talk about events often for our work is building the field. And what does that look like? And so a lot of times you're looking to make those introductions and those cross pollinating um, kinds of spaces so that, um, cause you don't know, you don't know what these two people are gonna produce a research paper on and that could really like change the field. Um, and so those are kind of the moments that we try to, you know, a little bit manufacture um, in our events because and um, that's where we see the greatest return. I think there's a big potential takeaway here for people who produce traditional events too, and that it sounds like your ROI, as it were, or the change that you're looking for is sometimes, but perhaps rarely linear, where funder comes, understands, is now better able to make a case and fund the work. That's a pretty linear return, but collaborations and papers and you know uh, opinions being changed over time both harder to measure and harder to um like they come in sideways you know, yes an indirect but very meaningful result of the work yeah absolutely and i think there's other things that we started doing a little bit more where um we've like recognized that like maybe some of the messaging that we're, that we're putting out around our specific issues starts to get picked up. You know, there's like a messaging campaign that we started last year um, that was just more than a check that this idea that a guaranteed income. So that's like, you know, regular cash to people with no strings attached is more than a check. It's all of these other things. It's the time you get to spend with your family. It's the freedom to make choices on your own. Um, It's the The, the dignity dignity of being able to make those choices on your own. So I think we started talking about it this way and we really kind of infuse that into um, a lot of our events and how we talk about the issue. And, and, then went back and did a little bit of a earned media analysis around like how much that phrase had gotten picked up as well. So I think that there's, um, yeah, there's ways to see, there's ways, (laughs) not always numbers, but to see how uh, your your messaging is kind of um, catching on. 
I'm going to come back to this, uh, but I'm going to pause first and ask you about a, you know, a particular event that you're really proud of, which was, I also just love the name of, which was Bold versus Old. Um, and what, what did that, what were you trying to do <laughs> with Bold versus Old? And then what did you actually do with Bold versus Old? Oh yeah. Cause we always know that those don't, <laughs> those two <laughs> things are so rarely the same. There's the same answer. Um, so the, the kind of provocation that we had there is that at the time we were a single issue organization and we were working on guaranteed income, which is a big, bold, progressive economic idea. But what we found was that there were other big, bold, progressive economic ideas and we were kind of getting pitted against each other. So it was like, was it a guaranteed income or a jobs guarantee? You had to pick one. And that often happens when you get to, you know, the legislative piece of a fight because mm -hmm. people are concerned about budget and are kind of locked into those scarcity mindsets. And so what we wanted to do with that event, it was in the spring of 2019 and we held it in DC. And so what we wanted to do was kind of both inject our issue, guaranteed income, into the, the field of electoral politics for the year. Because remember in the spring of 2019, we had a whole slate of Democratic candidates um, for Everybody. Everybody. Presidential, possible presidential candidates. And we also wanted to say, hey, really, it's not like, is this big economic idea or this one? It's not or, it's and. And how can we sit all of these ideas next to each other in not so much a platform as like a buffet for whichever democratic presidential candidate might um, succeed there so that they could like see all of these ideas together and we could have this kind of um, this kind of excitement about the future that we could build kind of beyond uh, some of the scarcity that our current you know, neoliberal capitalism kind of confines us to. So it was like really exciting to see all of these big ideas together and the kind of talent um, and big uh, political names that we were able to draw um, from that. And I think, you know, I, I think that we had, well, they're pretty lofty goals to start off with, <laughs> but I think we succeeded kind of beyond our wildest dreams there in terms of building new coalitions of progressive uh, organizations that were working on some of these bold ideas. And also, um, and also those kinds of like that I was describing, those kinds of like intangible relationships. So not just the collaborating, but for us and on an organizational level, but people who met at the event, um, who went on to collaborate. I think another fun thing was that we commissioned some artwork um, to be shown at the event and it got turned into a coffee table book. Like mm. there were just like some really fun um, ways that we felt like there were ripples uh, from that event that kind of um, still inform our work today. So when you're conceptualizing a, a convening or a conference or anything else, do you brainstorm like, these are the outcomes we would hope to see and these are the outcomes if we, we might be really, you know, we could possibly see, we might be lucky enough to see. Do you spend time thinking like, how will we, how will we know at the early stages? How will we know we've succeeded um, so that you can be looking for them and measuring them? Because I think that's a place a lot of folks fall down. It's like mm -hmm. if it's, if it's less tangible than like, oh, we raised half a million dollars. Yeah, totally. I, I hear that. And I think benchmarks are important. And we do spend some time um, defining like what success looks like. Um, and I also think that like when making those goals, it's really important. I, I think even in the design phase, like, you know, we sit down and we're like, who, what, where, when? Mm -hmm. I think people start with what, and there's a reason why who is first. <laughs> who needs to be first? Yes. And I think in, in stating your outcome, your desired outcomes or your goals, like the who needs to be foregrounded as well, you know? So it's like, you can have all of the like, kind of what tangibles of like what you did or something. But I also think that, you know, there's something that really speaks volumes when you get back the, um, the photos from your event and you can see people laughing and like, sharing a moment and some drinks and food with each other 
that's that's great. It's not just a great feeling for someone who is an event organizer, but guess what? That transmits a lot to funders. And it also is a memory that those people are gonna have. And I think like those are really important um, to like foreground in how you measure success as well. So in that also in the starting with who, this brings up something I know you care and, and lead with, uh, with your team and with your colleagues is the idea of audience or attendee centered design. And the experience is for that. We need them to do something, the folks in attendance, we want them to learn something, meet someone, hear a message that we're sharing. So what experience do we need to create for them to have the best time while they're there and create that memory and have that laugh? and share that moment with somebody else. How do you how do you guide other people on your team or your collaborators through a process of thinking about those experiences? I think that's, um, first of all, Paige, let me just say that's what one of the reasons, one of many reasons why I enjoy working with Kennedy events so much is because I feel like we're very aligned on that, um, where um, we can go in to a space and immediately think about what the experience of the person walking into that space for the event might be. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think, um, I think really centering event design around that who can look like a lot of different things. Um, one, it's a lot of like, you know, the guest consideration experience, like design pieces. So that's like, what are you eating? What are you eating? And not just like, what are you eating? Where did it come from? Who cooked it for you? You know, like um, getting all of that story into something as simple as the catering, like um, can really transmit a lot to the person who's walking into the space. And I think there's other things like that too, like, you know, having gender neutral bathrooms, um, having accessibility, like all taken care of so that everyone who walks in feels welcome. Um, and I also think that I think that there's probably something else there around like opportunities for <clears throat> for input and connection, whether that's input into the actual agenda or input in terms of raising your hand and asking a question during a panel or um, or, you know, some some other kind of audience interaction um, uh, method. I think it's important for people to feel like they're part of it. Um, but I also wanted to say that when we're talking about the who, I think that one thing that's, I think, super key when thinking about events as organizing is that it's not just, a, it's not a, a, it's not a top down one way kind of street in terms of this is for the, the, the audience that's in the seats specifically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of other people um, that this event will be impactful for. And whether that's a digital crowd that's watching online and thinking about them and, and you know, foregrounding their experience of the thing as well. And maybe sometimes, <clears throat> by the way, maybe sometimes <laughs> making choices between, well, if I have a digital uh, audience and a IRL in real life audience, like I can't do both of those well. So I can, I'm not gonna have a hybrid event or whatever that is. Um, there's also the who of who's on stage. And I think that events can be super powerful organizing tools for the people who are on stage as well. And so having those people feel well cared for from top to bottom, and that includes things like um, speaker prep and, um, and all of the like, you know, things that you're so great at thinking about at Kennedy too, which is like, you know, green room accommodations and and like how the speakers are getting there and how we take care of them through the whole process. Um, those can be really, those can be really pivotal moments in people's careers. Mm -hmm. You know, they might think that that might be something that they're like, oh, well, at this event, I met this other person. It could lead them down a new path of work or it could lead them down a new path of advocacy in terms of how they speak about the other issues that are on the table. And so I think it's really important to think about, um, yeah, to think about like, you know, all of the pieces of the, of the who in all of the ways. <laughs> you're, you're reminding me that when you, um, when you 
elevate somebody to the stage fi figuratively i don't i mean uh, you are like you might be enforcing for them for the first time an idea of themselves as a person with a position that other people might want to hear and it's a really um it's a big moment to um empower them and remind them of that and they can walk away with a completely different experience of themselves that is fostered by the organization that chose to host them or hear from them and um you also said something really powerful in there that I don't want to lose. Oh, I was thinking as you were talking about, it's not just the people in the room or the people who might be watching remotely, but there's the knock on effect of what of, oh, maybe I'm the, maybe I'm the CEO of the small organization that chose to send you. And, mm -hmm. and I'm also a, a, a who in all of this. It was my budget, my budget that justified this. It was my, you know, um, giving you the space to go and I need I'm going to get something from you coming back and speaking of your experience as well um, yeah I love that I love that ripple effect and I think that that's um that is 100% part of those kind of intangible like how do you measure how people walk away and start talking differently about things based on their experience at the event that you produced yeah yeah. So what, you know, we did a couple of things in the, in the fall, what's different in this moment that needs extra consideration in our, uh, middling non post COVID, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> moment, um, and, and we're still going through it moment. Um, yeah, I think, well, one of the things that I really, um, I, I have to say like, you know, the pandemics, it's been difficult for a lot of reasons on a lot of levels. And I don't feel like we're back in any way to where we were before, so maybe especially in terms of producing live events. However, I also think that um, people are really craving um, kind of personal connection and, and talking to people maybe they've been working with over the last two years, three years that they've never met before. And I do think there's opportunity there. Um, and I think also it forced us to get creative about some of the ways that we're um, fostering these connections. Like there was an event that I was meant to produce um, in the summer of 2020. And instead, uh -huh. <laughs> I know, and instead um, we decided we still wanted to engage all these folks and these, these thinkers and, and get them to talk. And so we kind of structured this um basically like a pen pal situation where people um eds of progressive organizations got paired with other eds and they got to have like pretty intimate exchange of ideas um and it went so well that we decided to keep meeting and eventually that's the event that we worked on um to produce this past spring of 22 um where they finally got to see each other together and so then we had this great thing where over the last two years, some of these people had been writing each other and never met in person. And so that magic, when they finally get to meet, um, just, I mean, you can't, you can't replicate that like that. You can't. Uh, no, that's too beautiful. I love it. <laughs> it's like, it, it makes me think of, uh, you know, just dating myself here, like getting your college roommates names and phone numbers before you went off to school and you only talked on the phone and you, you discussed who was going to bring the fridge and who was going to chip in for the toaster oven or the hot pot. These were the things. And then you met and a thing of beauty. Yeah. We <laughs> yeah. don't have those. We don't have those analog uh, to live experiences anymore. Cause we're all like this. We're all able to on zoom That's really, really powerful. <laughs> um, so with the time with the very limited time we have left, I'm curious who else in this world and in this space you admire um or you you look to or learn from um in terms of like the kind of narrative shift work that i really love doing um the national domestic workers alliance is really just light years ahead of everyone else for my money um they're so good they're in writers rooms in hollywood um they're organizing their base and taking those stories and elevating them to places that um I'm sure no one thought that they would ever go. Um, and they're, so they're doing that all the way from um, 
their kind of base to, you know, being invited to the White House to be influencers on key policies that affect um, caretakers. So I feel like um, I feel like they they wrote the playbook in a lot of ways, um, and I really appreciate how um, they're willing to follow a story no matter where it goes and um, kind of ground their people. And we're going a little long, and so we're getting. Uh, I'm gonna. I was gonna say, and so we're getting interrupted. But um, I remember you talking about the National Domestic Workers Alliance and this the writers' room thing sounds so powerful to me. It's just really creative thinking to affect change. And um, yes, I can see why they would be they'd be so admirable. That's really cool. I feel like I learned something every exciting and new every time I talk to you. And so thanks so much for your time to yeah. Aw, uh, thanks so much for your time today, Kara. Um, where can people, where would you prefer people find you and find your work? Oh, um, you know, I have a website. It's Kara Rose DeFabio. Um, if you just Google that, you'll find it. Um, and um, Economic Security uh, Project is the organization I work for. And you can see a lot of my current work there. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Kennedy Events Podcast. Come back next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.